Brilliant. Thank you very much for the invitation. So let me start sharing the screen and see if we are successful in this first step. Yes. And now I'm going to open the chat. Um, and if, um, if uh, anybody wants to ask something, I will try to keep an eye on the chat, but please, you know, mute yourselves and, and ask the question, interrupt. I love, you know, like interaction and so forth. So, so don't be afraid to say, ah, <laughs> what is this? Yeah, so, so um, thank you very much, everyone, for making the time of being here and listening to, to, to this talk. So um, I'm going to start with motivating um, what is going on. So, so the, first, the first question that we have is what do we know about uh, urban systems and how we can then think about the challenges ahead. And if we think carefully about what is it that we know about uh, urban systems, we do know a lot of things. So, so urban systems are composed of people because without people, we wouldn't have cities, we wouldn't have uh, urban systems to, to, to worry about. And we do know a lot about the behavior of individuals. We have entire disciplines that have evolved in order to, to, to understand what is going on with individuals from anthropology, social sciences, psychology, and so forth. And of course, these individuals come together to form institutions and uh, they interact within this space and need to construct different land uses according to the different necessities which are distributed in space. And then we can start to think about how these things are distributed, how these things evolve, how people needed to move from one place to another. And we have another discipline, which is transport, which is also a discipline that we know a lot uh, uh, about. And uh, in doing so, people have been modifying their cities in order to fit their needs. And uh, they have been modifying the morphology of uh, the city they have been modifying the planet and we have all these issues such as uh, climate change that we need to address. So of course, we need to understand how all these things evolve in order to be able to then propose anything to change the system through uh, a different driver. And uh, as people come together, they agglomerate, they create cities, and of course, this also creates other nonlinear effects which can be positive but also negative, right? And um, Nowadays, we're a bit more careful about thinking about cities, not only with respect to their functions, but also how are people living in these cities, the well-being of, of, uh, of these cities. We're thinking more about livability, so we're moving as well towards these uh, communities, how, how people are uh, uh, thriving within, uh, within these cities, and how these cities, of course, um, are considering everybody, right? Because uh, there is uh, a lot of inequality, and, and most of the time, the motivations to, to grow the city, to develop further the cities or more economic um, motivations that are leaving some people behind. So we're thinking about how these things are evolving. All these institutions, all these have regulations in order to ensure that things are done uh, properly. So we start to think about all these bottom-up uh, interactions and things that are created uh, from individuals and this top-down interventions, regulations, and uh, governments. And so we do know a lot about these systems, but of course the challenge is to understand how these systems are going to evolve and change. Okay, so, and, and this of course is, is, is the big issue, how we have many different shocks, unexpected shocks, such as, uh, for example, here in the UK, we have Brexit, and then we have COVID, which is a, a global thing. And so how cities are going to be looking in 50 years is a, is a question that is very difficult uh, to answer, of course. And uh, all we can do with the models and so forth is propose scenarios of how the system will be changing according to certain drivers. So um, overall, we do know a lot about all these systems. And the main challenge is how we integrate them. Because of course, whatever you do and you move in one of these systems is going to be affecting the other one. So these systems are interacting. They're not living in different bubbles and they're independent of each other. They're interacting. And so there is a strong feedback between each of those. So overall, the picture is yes, we know about all these systems, but we need to understand better these relationships. So we need to understand better these arrows, how there is a relationship between, between all these different layers, the different systems of our, our urban system. And of course, the tension between all these bottom-up configurations and the top-down uh, 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 interventions. Okay, so overall, 
with all this introduction, what I wanted to motivate is the need to approach uh, and to, to, to further our understanding of cities and urban systems in general through the perspective of complexity science, which is something that uh, people have been talking about, you know, like for many, many decades uh, already. Okay, even though it wasn't formulated as such in terms of complexity science, but the idea of systems of systems embedded and so forth is something that uh, 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 people have been working with uh, for many, many decades um, already. Okay, so what are the main outstanding challenges? Of course, I'm not going to be exhaustive in the list of outstanding challenges because <laughs> we could stay here all, all day in the seminar discussing and having a very strong, you know, like which is more important than another one. So of course, we, we could already get all the SDGs and start to think about all these outstanding challenges that have been already uh, uh, commented and, and, and so forth. But uh, at the moment, I'm going to be very simplistic about outstanding challenges with respect to the modeling of this uh, urban system. So the first thing is that with respect to this problem of understanding the feedbacks and so forth between the different layers of the system, one initial thing is how are we making sure that we're incorporating all the different components into the system, okay? So how are we making sure that there are aspects for the same system, the extension of the system and what we are considering is including everyone. So you can think, for example, when, when uh, you get many indicators for city, you, you get many statistics, people are talking about the 100 biggest cities. And so they're leaving behind on all the smaller ones. And if you think about uh, why this is happening, you can even go back to the distribution of cities, right? So, so we have a regularity that is, uh, that is there for, for, for most countries. So we, we, we have something from which we can say, yes, ZIF's law uh, holds. So for the ones that are not familiar with this uh, law, it tells us that uh, you, you can run the cities according to their size. And you have then the biggest city, the second biggest one will be one half the size of the biggest one, the third one will be one third the size of, of the first one and so forth. And of course, this is a statistical regularity, which means that it's not exact. <laughs> and it holds, you know, up to, 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 to statistical uh, uh, um, verification, so to say. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, exact. Um, and so then that's the first thing, right? So we are considering cities. What is a city? Which ones are we leaving behind? I'm not going to be talking about that uh, today, but it's something to think about when we're, when we're thinking about systems of, uh, of, uh, of cities, for example. The other thing is that when we're coupling, um, when we're thinking about a system in a, in a, in a city. So we're considering the feedback, but it's also the feedback across scales. So we're concentrating in a city, but what happens if we think about the regional level? So how an intervention in a city is going to affect the regional level and how it's going to affect the next city? So what, what, uh, what are the scales of interactions that are going to be, to be affecting? So how can we, even within the same system, how can we think across scales? So uh, most of the time we will have an intervention at regional level and we hope <laughs> that everything that is inside this region will benefit from this intervention. Well, how exactly is going to happen? It's, it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, um, very well detailed in such an intervention because it's not well known. So understanding the relationship between the different elements at different scales is something absolutely essential to see how one intervention at one level is going to spill over or is going to be benefited by other people in, uh, in the system. And of course, um, that, that leads us to, 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 to the main challenge, which is the coupling of systems. So we know a lot about each of those, and we know that if we're going to modify one of the systems, we're going to be affecting the other one. And we hope for the best, but we don't know exactly how these uh, relationships are going to happen most of the time. Why is that? Because you have systems that evolve very rapidly, and you have other ones that evolve very slow. So when you're affecting one that evolves very rapidly, you don't think about the one that is evolving very slow. So how can you then couple these systems taking into consideration the different types of dynamics of these layers, right? So, 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 so this is, this is um, a challenge uh, 
of course. And why are we worried about all this? Well, so we want more inclusive cities. We want more resilient uh, 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 cities for many different uh, fields. So the way we're going to think about resilience is not one overarching resilience for the system. It is related to the system in question that we're thinking, okay? But that system, say the economic system, will depend on the transport system, will depend on the education system, and we depend on this other one. So how in the couple system we can measure this resilience? And of course, I'm presenting this as challenges that are open questions, and I do not pretend in the list <laughs> to be able to give you an answer you know, of uh, how, what is it that we can do? I just uh, can give you, you know, insights into the sort of things that we have been doing to try to couple the system and to try to understand um, the different scales uh, and, and, and so forth. So, so these are, these are uh, challenges that we are still um, in hope to, 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 to figure out. So we've been trying to understand uh, these challenges. So coming to the first one, you know, like which are the components and so forth. So I'm going to give you an example and I'm going to be talking about the importance of defining um, the systems, right? So the first thing when we're analyzing uh, a city, for example, and we want to figure out a specific problem, we need a diagnosis before trying to do anything beyond that modeling the system and so forth. So when we're doing a diagnosis to identify the problem, what is it that we're including in the city and who are we included in the city? So of course, this question most of the time is limited by the sort of data that we have, right? Because um, who is included, all the legal, uh, 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 all the people living illegally in a country, for example, won't be included in the census. And so when the statistics are being done, these people are not included, even though they're a very important part of the system. So these are limitations, of course, that we need to understand that when we're doing our models, what is that we're leaving behind and uh, what is it that we can do with what uh, we have. And so most of the time, this is what happens. We have these uh, the limitations of we have cities in which we're giving a definition that is a del uh, an administrative delimitation that is um, uh, built you know or, or on a heuristic that varies from country to country so we don't have a universal heuristic for building uh, uh, cities uh, um, in general so for example in france that have uh, this one in which we're going to say that the continuous one of the different def the, the, the definitions going to, to, to look at the continuous of the urbanized space in which you consider 200 meters of separation between uh, the buildings. Uh, but then you're thinking, okay, but you're talking about the urbanized space, you could get satellite images and the extent and so forth. And, and then you start to think about the complications of that in which you will have something that is more dynamical to how these administrative definitions are changing. Um, on the other hand, you will, you will argue, right, but... Um, the continuous urbanized space doesn't take into account the economic functional areas, so from which people live and commute to work to this area. So, so for this, people think about metropolitan areas. So all the extended, all these other areas that are not part of the core urbanized space, but from which people commute to work and are contributed to the city and so forth, right? So we have a definition of metropolitan area that also changes and it's not that uh, universal, but in general, you can find that is defined according to 30% of commuters coming to, 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 to the city. And then you have other types of definition as the Chinese cities that uh, uh, I'm not very familiar with, but I always have great trouble <laughs> trying to understand how it works. And it's more in terms of levels of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the space and you will have what you will recognize as the core in the urbanized space, including some rural areas and other, other settlements as well. Okay, so it's a bit of a more complex uh, 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 structure. And, um, and of course, the challenge here is to be able to harmonize with all these different definitions in order to be able to build uh, a measure, a model that, uh, that is valid for all of them, or otherwise to adjust and understand very well what is it that is included or not. Because of course, the data, once again, will be given in terms of these administrative definitions. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, for my example today, I'm going to talk about uh, um, a project that we, we just completed that regarded the problem of water in Mexico City. So as I was introduced, I'm a physicist, 
right? I, I, uh, I met with these wonderful people to, to be able to work on this program, but I'm not the one developing uh, models of, of, of water, so you're not afraid. <laughs> Yeah. What I'm going to say later on is a, is a specialist that developed this, uh, this model. I contributed in the way that I'm going to show you uh, today. Right, so Mexico City, Tenochtitlan. So uh, Mexico City was actually founded on a lake. And it was like a little Venice, if, uh, well, a big Venice, actually, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, you look at it. So it was composed of like different islands that were interconnected by bridges and canals and so forth. So this is how Mexico was founded in a valley in this lake in uh, 1325, okay, up until 1521 when the Spanish arrived and, um, and colonized, well of course they arrived earlier, but I mean like to this specific city, and colonized uh, um, Mexico. So this is how it looks like. So you will have a life in which people will be will have lots of water <laughs> and, uh, and uh, to be able to irrigate, cultivate and so forth in addition to, to, to trade. And of course, you will have these little bridges here that you will be able then to disconnect from mainland. So I'm not going to go into the mythology of how is it that they decided to create the Aztecs, the city there, you know, uh, you can see it in our flag. Well, actually, I'm going to tell you. So, so, so the whole idea is that these uh, these Mexicas, so the Aztecs that came to here, were going to to be settled uh, in a place in which they were going to see an eagle devouring a snake on the top of a cactus. And this is where they saw it. And this is why in our flag we have, you know, like the the, the eagle devouring. Um, so you can all Google the Mexican flag uh, while I'm talking to you. And so this is how it looked like. So, so you 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 wonder when you see these pictures. How is it that Mexico has a problem of water, right? And then this is Mexico City today. So Mexico City is this red boundary that you have here. So it is on a valley, so you see all the mountains around, but you don't have this lake any longer, right? And so what is going on with, uh, with this uh, city that uh, had a lot of water <laughs> a few hundred years ago? So, so this water has, was drained, you know, the, the, the Spanish thought, oh my God, we're going to be flooded. So they started to drain, 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 drain. And so until the whole thing was uh, dried out. And um, the way, the way uh, uh, we live nowadays in that city is with shortages of water absolutely all the time. So everybody has, you know, like a, a, a tank on top of their house from which they draw water. So the water is cut, you don't have water all the time, but you draw it from this tank as well. So you have, so what is going on is that 50% of this water is extracted more or less uh, from uh, the, the, the aquifer below. But of course you have all this old system of pipes in which, you know, that, that, that are damaged. And, and so you're losing a lot of, the, of, uh, of that water. In addition, you have, uh, a lot of informal settlements or even formal, you know, that don't have uh, uh, water and you have lots of people living in absolutely dreadful uh, condition. So in addition of the water that you take, you can also think about drainage and you can think about waste water and then the pollution to all these places, people trying to get some water from the pipes and it's, it's all a, a, a very uh, a big mess of pollution, mismanagement, distribution and so forth. So. It's a very, very big problem in, in, in Mexico, um, the problem of water. So what we did for this specific uh, project is to measure the socio-hydrological resilience of Mexico City. So what do you mean about this uh, socio-hydrological uh, resilience? Sounds a bit uh, uh, extravagant. So the main idea is to, to, to think about the water stress. So, so if you think about, you know, like... Um, the availability of, uh, of water, what are the needs of, uh, of, of people living in the city with respect to the uh, um, availability and the, so the demand for this uh, um, fresh water, the aquifers, all the physical aspect and, and so forth, and the adaptive capacity of the system. So this relates more to the social aspect, but also the, the, the physical aspect of um, of uh, the whole thing, but taking into the into consideration as well the education of the of the people, the the income of the people, and so forth. So overall, this is how it looks like. So we have an index that is created out of two other indices, from which 
the water stress relates to water pollution, water resource exploitation, water scarcity, water resource variation, and so forth. And then you have this other aspect, which is the adaptive capacity index, which relates, relates to the economic capacity, human resources, the physical capacity, and the natural capacity. Okay, so these are the two main things that are going to be uh, 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 taken in order to create our index. Right, so we have all the ingredients. We have a, a super expert uh, 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 earth scientist that knows everything about all these things. So let's get to work. And so we look at the system, right? And um, I'm from Mexico City. I lived there all my life until I moved to the, to the UK. And I was living in this part that is not part of the boundary of uh, Mexico City, but it didn't feel that way. You know, it didn't feel as if I was living on the outskirts in the least. There was no kind of uh, 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 discontinuum or, or, or a very long way, you know, like I was part of the, <laughs> of the whole mess of Mexico City as anybody else. And so when I look at these uh, definitions of cities, um, I always get really uh, bothered by this, right? Not only because um, if you look at the amount of people, so if you ask, you know, what is the population of uh, Mexico City? people will say like around 22 million, you know? That's what we will say. And then you look at it and it, actually that's not the case. Mexico City as such, it's half of it, right? Well, a bit less than that, it's like nine uh, uh, million people. And it is the whole metropolitan area that is around 22 million people. And so with this in mind, of course, you can either take the perspective of let me take the whole uh, metropolitan area instead of only Mexico City, but we were tasked with Mexico City. So we said, okay, let us try to think about an extended Mexico City, you know, like the minimalistic <laughs> extension of Mexico City that is not the full metropolitan area. So what are the main issues and, 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 and um, that come to mind when you think about it? So as I was saying, in my experience, I felt really connected to, to, to the city. So we, we think about how we use the city, how we live in the city. So we think about these possible interactions with individuals and the space and so forth. So we're going to then construct this city, this extended city. So we're going to extend Mexico City, taking into account the interactions. So of course, we don't know the interactions. Yes, we don't know exactly what is going on. We don't have all this amazing mobile phone data in order to be able to see where people are moving to and create then this new definition based on the true mobility and interactions of individuals. So because of that, we need to create proxies for this. So one of the proxies is that you're going to be using your city according to the connectivity of the city. So a place that is really, really far away from you, you're not going to be using it very well, that it, it's, it's complicated to get there, right? So we're going to see how from one place to another, the connectivity of the city looks like. Um, then for the interactions of individuals, we're going to be considering that uh, um, because we don't know how people interact, we're going to use the principle of homophily. So we're going to say there is a, a higher probability of people interacting if they are similar. Right, so, so this is just an assumption that we're going to be using in our, in our system. And how are we going to look into this similarity of, uh, of individuals? We're going to take such demographic data and we're at the, at, the, at the block level and we're going to see how they look, uh, uh, the similarity between these characteristics. So of course, this is a strong assumption, but is, is the one that we're going to be using. And then we're going to see what happens in the system. So for the connectivity, the physical proximity of our of our city, we take the road network. And uh, of course, when you look at the road network, you have double carriageways, you have a roundabout, and you have all these very complicated structures. So we just simplify this structure and create a simple uh, a road network. Doesn't look like this exactly, but, <laughs> but, but more or less you get the idea that from, from um, a complicated uh, 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 street network, you just get just nodes and links, period, in which, the link is going to have the distance between the two points. And these points are just the points of intersections in your street network. Yes. So roundabout that normally has a four roads will be one node connected to four different uh, roads. And then 
once we have this, we're going to evaluate the connectivity of the system according to the distance between these uh, intersections, okay? So if, the, if we have a very dense, so basically what we're going to do is you look at the city and the very dense areas are going to be cluster uh, uh, faster than the less dense areas. And so you first are going to see the very dense areas and then you're going to see the less dense areas. It doesn't mean that these are not a community on their own, okay? But you will be able to differentiate between these and see how the whole system integrates. And for the sociodemographic data, what we're going to do is that we have, a, um, we have a Mexico City and, 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 and we extended, sorry, so apologies that in this, uh, in this uh, map, I don't have the extended version couldn't find the shape file for the extended version, but this is what we did for the extended version. We took, we took the, the full metropolitan area, not only, not only this uh, result, and then we took the centroid for each of these. Uh, uh, um, so here it, it's uh, at a larger level because otherwise you cannot see anything, but we took it at the block level, at the level that we have the data. Okay, so of course we're always, we, 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 we need to take the, the minimum area that we have depending on, on, uh, on the data set that, that, uh, that is available, right? I mean, we cannot do otherwise. And so we take the centroids of these areas and then we create the linear triangulation. So basically what we're saying is, I want to see how I look like with respect to my neighbors, okay? So this is why we take a Delaunay triangulation. So basically what it does is that it connects you to your nearest neighbor and so forth, okay? So it triangulates the space according to your nearest uh, um, uh, neighbors. And so in the end, what we have is another network. So we have on the one hand, the network of, of the streets, the connectivity that is given by the infrastructure. And then on the other hand, we have another network that we created according to your neighbors. So this is, this is how it, lo it, would, it would look like. And the link, so the, the nodes are the centroids of these areas. And the link is going to be the similarity between these two areas. Okay, so for this similarity measure, you can use many different functions. Um, in this, uh, for this work, we use the cosine distance. So basically what we did is that we took, for each area, we took a vector in which we will have all the different sociodemographic characteristics. So the ones that were mostly available in the, in, um, in, in the data set. And of course, we look into correlations and we, we standardize and, uh, and so forth. And then, we have for each, each area has a vector, and then we see how similar these vectors are. So let's say if, if you only had men in one and you only had women, they will be perpendicular, and so the cosine similarity will be zero, yes? If they had only men and men and women, it will create an angle, yes? And so it will be different from zero, but it won't be completely similar and so forth. So this is the idea behind the cosine similarity, okay? So how different these, ang these angles uh, uh, are. And so this is what we get. Apologies for this crazy. <laughs> we don't mind, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't slow it down. I created it uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, so these are, these are the street uh, uh, networks. So as we look into, let us, let us start with the, denser areas, and I'm going to only be plotting the 10 largest, I don't know how many I have there. Yeah, I think it's 10. The 10 largest clusters that I obtain. And so the red one is the largest one, then it's the blue one, and then it's the, it's the green one and so forth. And I'm just going, so the, the, the ones that you don't see is not because they don't exist, it's because I'm only plotting the 10 largest one, otherwise it becomes really messy. And uh, as I keep going with, my, with my, my, my clustering according to distance, then you can see how it starts to fill the space, yes? Okay, so I have, I have uh, this, uh, this uh, exercise. And I do the same for the sociodemographic uh, uh, network that I constructed. So, so then this is what you obtain. I mean, this is just like three <laughs> of the visual, three of the maps uh, uh, from, from, uh, from this exercise that you just saw in the video. So um, if I plot the largest ones at a distance of around 100 meters, this is, this is what I see, okay? Um, and this is this is for a threshold, a sociodemographic threshold that I that I that I excluded because otherwise 
uh, you will ask what is this sociodemographic uh, threshold because it relates to cosine similarity and doesn't 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 say much in that uh, in that uh, respect. But if I if if one one of the things that I, I would like you to see is this this area here, okay. So basically, as I am evolving my network with respect to being more flexible, as you know, like I, I, they might not be that similar, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm going to include them. So this is how I will go in this direction. And then here, you know, like you, you will say, well, um, it's not that dense, but I'm also allowing to, to, to for, for, for a larger distance. So what I would like you to see is how this red area here is, uh, is already part of the largest cluster at uh, 100 meters, okay? And as I continue, it becomes also part of the largest cluster uh, straight away, yes? And then this other area here, this green one, also um, uh, before my whole picture, so, so apologies for the lack of clarity of this map, the, the, the boundaries that are in black are the ones that represent what is Mexico City. And then all the other stuff is the, the, the the, um, the metropolitan area, okay? So we're looking into extending these black uh, uh, boundaries. And so here you can see that this one is becomes part of this black boundary even before we have these other sectors and so forth, okay? And so if we look at what is it that we're excluding in this, uh, in this uh, uh, investigation, if we were only to take uh, uh, Mexico City as the, the, the minimalistic definition of 9 million people, just this cluster here has 1.1 million people. I mean, it's, it's uh, and, and if you look at this cluster, it's, this, this is a crazy cluster, okay? And also in my experience of Mexico, you know, like, so it's called Ciudad Netzahualcoyot, which means Mex which means the Netzahualcoyot city, yes, as a, as a kind, of, kind of independent city, but it's, it's connected as you saw, you know, to the whole city, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see, you know, like that you have to go into another, it's just there, you know, it's, 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 it's just there. And, and it's a crazy sight when you look at this. Of course, without me having to tell you anything about this place, you can see straight away that this is a place where there is a lot of poverty, right? You don't see green spaces and so forth. And, uh, and, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a place that um, when they were extracting all the water from the uh, uh, Lago de, from the de Texcoco uh, uh, Lake, this is like uh, one of the last places in which you know, like you will have, uh, you will have uh, land. And then it became very messy, you know. So because it wasn't, it was later that you would have access to this area. So it was like, okay, so who owns this? Oh, well, the government, yes, I own this, no, no, I own. And then it became, you know, like people took advantage of this and started to sell parcels, even though there was not their parcels. And you can imagine how these type of things happen in, in, in Latin America in general. And, and so I, can what, I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Uh, is there any administrative difference between the Mexico City when you when you're in this area when you're crossing the boundary from the from the Mexico City to the metropolitan area? Yes, yes, there is, and that's a very important question, right? Because we go back to 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 the idea that not only the data, but if you're going to then be thinking about an intervention, what sort of intervention are you going to be doing so, such that you have uh, you have a uh, 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 the same, the same uh, as policy makers and uh, the same laws applying and so forth. So this is a very, very important uh, um, question. Yes, thank you. And also for, for, for the rest, you know, like the, yeah, you, like, like um, even, so Mexico City has the largest university in Latin America that is also independent. So let's say if police were chasing you, <laughs> you could go to the university and they cannot chase you <laughs> any longer in there because of this differentiated uh, uh, loss. So yes, important uh, question there. And the Tlatuani is, uh, so what, what it means is uh, hungry uh, coyote, uh, 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 which, is, which was the king of uh, Texcoco. He was, he was actually a poet. He was an, an aristocrat that was a poet. So this Netzawal coyote existed uh, back in the day. Right, so what do we do with all this? So we take all these different ingredients that we're talking about, and then we create this index. And in order to be able to, to, to do something useful for stakeholders, we created this web tool in which 
people could go and point at a specific place and see what is going on at this specific uh, uh, place. But uh, more importantly, the relationship between what is going on at this place with respect to its neighbors and so forth. And what's going to happen if you don't do anything by 2050, right? So, so, so we, we developed this tool um, to be able to look into this uh, type of things. And uh, then what? Okay, so you diagnose the system first and then the, the mitigation strategy that was proposed is constructed wetlands. So because it's such a complex problem in, in Mexico, this thing of distribution and you have corruption and you have all sorts of and pipes bursting <laughs> and all these type of, of, uh, of, uh, of issues, uh, a kind of cheap solution that is decentralized is this idea of the constructed wetlands, which basically they, they treat the, the, the domestic uh, waste uh, water generated by small communities. But then at the same time, these things can also um, be used, you know, like to cultivate and so forth, and then have another source of, uh, of income. And so having that in mind, then the idea is, okay, so how are you going to optimize the distribution of these constructed wetlands in your in your space because of course you know like you're you're given a budget right you don't have an infinite amount of budget otherwise you would put them everywhere <laughs> and so if you have a finite amount of, uh, of budget how you would prioritize certain areas over other ones and so the way to to to, to do this is to use another framework in which we look at the vulnerability of the area, but in, at the same time, the viability. So it's not only how vulnerable the area is, but also how, how, uh, uh, um, how, how to say, how, how good the area is as well in order to be able to implement such a, a strategy. So for example, the topography. So how many people am I benefiting, right? So the density, the population density, the green area density, the topography in order to be able to make something that works and so forth and, and the eco-technology. So would I be able to use this properly? And also, you know, like the, the environmental education. So, and this is where the social distance is important. So if your neighbor is uptaking this new technology, you will be more likely to, 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 to be able to, to, to uptake it than if nobody else is, right? So this, contagion process, you know, of how an, a, an, a new technology will be able to, or let's say we can think about vaccination, right? So if everybody around you is an anti-vaxxer, most likely you will also be, right? So, so, so this is where the social aspect as well is so important. Okay. And so we, in this web tool, you can see if you have a uh, for a limited uh, 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 budget, where would you put your your constructed wetland, and how this constructed wetland is going to benefit, right? So it's going to be, you know, like how many homes you're going to impact, how many uh, uh, um, how many flowers? I think there is somewhere. How how many yes plants are going to be planted? How many people are going to have new jobs and and so forth? And and of course this depends on the budget. So depending on the budget, this, this tool, um, it's a shame that I don't have like, a, I can show you later on, you know, on the, on the web page. Well, you can go into the web page and play around with it yourself. <laughs> you can put it in the link later on. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then see, then this, this provides really a visual aid in order to say, okay, so, so how much money do I need in order to invest in these uh, areas and who am I going to benefit? Okay, so with this initial part, so until what time do I have? Until 2.30, right? Because I think I'm, yeah, I'm about I'm, then. I'm taking too much time. Okay, so with the, in this initial part, what I wanted to show you is that this, this approach of constructed indices based on many different aspects of the system is something that has been done a lot uh, uh, traditionally, right? And so, of course, this is not con considering at all the, the, um, the evolution of the system and the feedbacks between, between them, right? So we don't have these dynamics coupled when we use this type of, uh, of, of uh, formalism. I mean, it's, it's already an effort, but of course, you know, it's still lacking all these correlations and, uh, and so forth. So of course, network science is something that is quite promising with respect to all the different 
things that have been evolving. And, and one of the things that I wanted to show you today is this clustering of, uh, of firms in the space. So um, what we try to do in this work basically is to incorporate two different types of interactions at the same time. So within the link, you know, we, in, in, the, in the previous work that we just showed, we, we showed you how you can represent a system in many different ways. So the same system was represented through its infrastructure and also through the relationship with respect to the spaces, uh, um, assuming a homophily uh, principle. Now, what we want to do is to look at the relationship between spaces, but in which this link is created through two different types of interactions and not only one, okay? So, so basically, this uh, uh, very much relates to innovation. So everybody is is, uh, is very hard. Well, there is a lot of a lot of work on clustering of economic activity on firms in order to understand better, you know, what are the drivers for innovation. And because I'm already running late, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not going to go into detail to that. But for example, in the UK, um, the before Brexit. <laughs> Before voting, and when I say before Brexit, I'm talking about last year, I'm talking about, about before voting for Brexit, there was already a worry with respect to developing an industrial strategy so that we will boost productivity in the, in, in, in the regions. In particular, if, if, if we think about the UK, we have, a, um, we have a, a system of cities in which the biggest systems, which is uh, London is a hub, is an economic hub, everybody, uh, knows uh, uh, about London and so forth. And then you have the other cities, <laughs> yes, the post-industrial cities that are not doing that well, right? So, so the whole idea, uh, uh, this unbalance in the economy of, uh, of the UK um, was, was a big factor of what happened uh, 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 with Brexit. So even before Brexit, people were already thinking about, okay, so what is it that we can do in order to rebalance the economy? In particular, to give more... Uh, um, more power to return power to all these uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, places to boost the economy of these places, making them work together, right? So, so you can think about this system of cities working together. In order to do that, you need to connect the cities. Okay, so you need to connect the cities. So let us then build, you know, HS2. So we have a we have a we have a new uh, uh, um, a new rail that is being sorted out, so we speak, um, with respect to connecting all these cities. But what is going on? Okay, so this is the result of the connectivity just of the road infrastructure in the UK. So if you look at it, you have in blue the London region, and then you have in red the, con the cities that will more or less be represented in this Northern powerhouse uh, uh, strategy. And you have Newcastle that is all the way up there, not part of this cluster. But it was put together into the same boat. And then the idea is, okay, so let us, let us then construct um, a, a, a rail that will be connecting all these places. But of course, the first question is that, well, if I'm connecting all this rail to, to, to London, am I going to be draining everything into, into London? Or am I really going to be, it's so expensive to, to live in London that I cannot imagine people living in London and going to, to work to Manchester and so forth, okay? So you can, you can start thinking about the implications of this and which way it's going to, to go. Um, and of course, Newcastle um, broke out of this Northern powerhouse <laughs> because it was disconnected. Um, and, and I think in the end now it's back. I'm not sure what happened, but... Um, Overall, the whole idea behind all this, of all this infrastructural effort is that your physical position very much determines your access to opportunities as well. So where you are is, is which opportunities, which economic opportunities are you going to have as well as an individual, in, a, in addition to thinking about all the different industries coming together in order to be able to, to, to match workers and, um, and so forth. So... Um, so basically, we, we look at this problem in a different way. So, so instead of, so, so this is, this is a, a problem, as I was uh, telling you, that has been looked at for many, many, uh, well, you can think about, you know, for, for more than 100 uh, uh, years, in which we think about the benefits of coming together um, for, for increased returns and so forth. So 
which framework you're going to be considering in order to, to, to cluster um, parts very much relates to the problem in question, right? And you, you will have many different uh, uh, perspectives of why you will have this type of, uh, of uh, phenomena uh, taking place. And so in our, in our work, we said, right, so, so considering all this, basically, you know, you can think about this idea of distance. So you have the proximity. So just by being close together, then you will be able to be uh, uh, more productive because of all these other things with respect to labor market interactions, knowledge spillovers, and so forth, right? And um, so I, I will leave you this for you to, 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 to explore in, in, in more detail um, afterwards. So, so basically, when, when you think about what does it mean, you know, like these, these clusters, you have like these two aspects. On the one hand, you have the geographical proximity of the firms, but on the other hand, you also have the, in, the similarity between the different industries that take place in the space, okay? And you will have a lot of works going into one direction or the other. And lately you had few works as well trying to combine these two. And normally you will have like, first I'm going to cluster by similarity and then I'm going to be clustering by proximity. Uh, I very much recommend to you to read this uh, piece of work because of course in this piece, what you will have is individuals that are working in different industries. And then you can really see the relationship and interaction, the real interactions and not just the proxies and the assumed one of how people from one place would be able to work in another one and what is the real relationship between that so this is a very very interesting uh, piece of work um, to read okay so what is it that we did in our in our work so what we did is like okay let us take into consideration the industrial proximity and the um, the physical proximity at the same level so instead of doing one and then the other we're going to be considering both at the same time. So what does it mean? It means I want to I want to have a network in which I am considering that two things are going to be happening at the same time. Two uh, areas that have a similar uh, um, industrial uh, um, profile are also going to be close in in space. Okay. So so this is this is the idea. Um, in order behind this work. And how to do this, we took um, data sets of the individual companies that are in, uh, in the Office of National Statistics secure <laughs> micro laboratory, which means that uh, you need, not only you need uh, permission in order to be able to access all, all that, you also need to do all the work in there in this space where you don't have internet and you know you have to leave your mobile on the side and 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 Clementine Cotino was the the, the researcher uh, doing well actually she was the one initiating uh, this work and she was the one doing all these things so there she is Clementine Cotino right so she was the one going there I was doing the the the, the codes and she was running them <laughs> In this laboratory without access to internet if things fail so 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 it's a, it's a bit of a lengthy process so what you have is uh, but what you have is very good data set with respect to the exact location and so forth of this uh, why it's so, so secure i don't know anyway um and uh, the way this data is uh, is given so you have uh, you have the 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 company you have the postcode and you have the industry uh, that is uh, uh, categorized in this kind of hierarchical way in which you have a main code, which is like a, only one digit. And then you have five other uh, digits that will tell you more about the degree of specialization of the industry. I should change the industry. You know why I have this uh, agricultural one instead of a technological one. Anyway, so, so this is how London looks like. So, so if, you, if you think about London, you can divide it uh, in units of, uh, of the census, which are called LSOs. And um, you see that these are heterogeneous because you're supposed to have more or less the same amount of people in them. Okay, so this is why they won't have the same, the same size. And so what do you do? You do it in a similar way to the Delaunay triangulation. 
you create, this is a fully connected network. So this is just an example of some of the nodes and some of the links, okay? This is not the full version. We, we did a fully connected network in this case. So, so we, we had um, a centroid for each of the areas, and then we created a link between them that I'm going to explain to you exactly how, how we did them. According to, let's say, if you want a distance, you could consider just the, 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 the distance between these two centroids. So all the firms that were in there will be close to all the firms that are in there, regardless of whether they're in the boundary or they are in the, in the, in the, in the you know, like the, the opposite boundaries of, of your area, you will have the same distance, right? Because you have everything aggregated at the LSOA level. And so, um, so basically what we do is that we, we according to the, the, the framework that you want to look at is, is the sort of measure that you're going to put into the link, right? So, so are you thinking about just the distance? Are you thinking about the relatedness in the product space, about the skill relatedness depending on your data, the sort of things that you have is what you can put in this link, yes? So, so, so there are many different uh, uh, possibilities. So doing the same as with the previous um, exercise of the Delaunay triangulation, so you have for each of the areas, the number of industries of these different categories. So how many zip codes, how many digits you're going to take in your zip code, that's also up to you, you know? I think for this one, we took three. And then you compute the cosine similarity in this way, in the same way as, uh, as, uh, as before, right? So on the one hand, you have already the cosine similarity. And then on the other one, you're worried as well with respect to the distance. Yes, so we said we're going to put these two together, right? So how do we put these two together? So basically we want the cosine similarity and the distance being part of the same link. The distance in this case, we're going to be considering instead of the physical distance, we're going to be considering transport because transport plays such an important role and it is the time it will take you to go to one place to another. And so for the distance, the time, we, we, we uh, took advantage of another project that is taking place at uh, CASA, that is the baby of uh, Michael Batty, I would say, Quant. And um, what this, uh, this uh, uh, modeling framework is, uh, is uh, attempting to do is that you have the whole of the UK, you have population, you have jobs, and then according to a multimodal a network approach, you're going to compute the time it takes you to go from one place to another. And then if you change something in the system, say more jobs, how many people are going, so sorry, what is, <laughs> they use the time, but what is computed is the flow. So what you want to know is if I change the system, how are the flows going to be changing in the system? So I took this network, I'm going to push because it's running late. So I took this network, of time from, from, from all the, 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 the different parts, from one LSOA to another one. And that includes if I have to walk to the underground, take the underground or take a bus, all that is included in this uh, fabulous network that was created by Richard Milton in that uh, laboratory. So I take that and I have on the one hand, I have my similarity and on the other, I have the time. So of course it's one over time because, because uh, 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 this link is telling you about the strength of the interaction, yes? And um, if the time is very small, it means that there is a big connection between these two spaces, I'm trying to, to talk fast and to say this thing. So because the similarity, if the similarity is high, then I want as well the, the time to be small. And so in order to put them together, that's why I have one over T, so that both of them go into the same direction, okay? And so how to do this? Then you compute the jump probability distribution of these two things happening at the same time. And this is the copula that I more or less borrow from, uh, from economics. They use it a lot. So that these things will happen at, uh, at the same time. So this is how this link is, is created through this uh, 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 copula, this joint distribution. And so what happens? is that depending on how strong you want this connectivity to be is how your system is going to look. So let's say I'm only allowing, you know, like a very strong similarity and a, and a very small time between these things. And these are the type of clusters that I'm going to obtain. So from 
2007, apologies, I forgot to say this. So we wanted to see what happened before the financial crash, okay? So 2007 and 2014, you know, considering the 2008 uh, financial crash. So how these two systems uh, um, um, evolve, sorry, how the system evolved following the financial uh, uh, crash. Something important to note is that transport didn't change, okay? I mean, might have, but uh, we didn't consider that, uh, we didn't take that into, I mean, it wasn't like a, an extreme shock to the system. But what did happen is a recombination of where the different firms were put in space. And um, what is important to note is that we don't have mostly, most of the time when one thinks about this clustering exercise, you're thinking about a single configuration. But in the end, what you have is, uh, is a nested configuration of all these things. So, so uh, the way to read this is um, you create, okay, so you create a tree, yes? So the top of the tree is the whole of the city, you know, when, when, when you allow everything to be connected. And then as you start to disconnect bits, you go down the tree, okay? So if you look, for example, at this region here, you know, this circle here, this corresponds to this bit in the tree, okay? So, um, more or less, this is this is this is this is the way to, to to see this thing, and so for example, you will have Canary Wharf. So Canary Wharf is where you have the new city, so to speak. So you have the banking system. Okay, so that's important because that's where all the banks, uh, uh, in addition to the city, uh, uh, are situated. And you will see that this is very far away from the rest uh, of the system. So this is 2007. After a financial crash, it moved all the way to here. So what happened is that. Many of these banks that went bankrupt had to trans how to be converted into different things, which were, you know, like fintech kind of companies. And so that provided a new cluster that didn't exist before. And this is something that you can see here, for example, this, this uh, violet one that appears over there. And I see that I, I absolutely run out of time and I still have a few things. The last bit that I promised with respect to the coupling, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have, but uh, I think I'm, 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 I'm done just, just one thing, okay? So, so, so the whole idea behind this, what, the message that I want to convey with this is that you have two very different trees in which the relationship between the elements have changed from 2007 to 2014. In, in this occasion, what changed was a reconfiguration of the type of firms that you had in the space. You could think as well that you could reconfigure the system in terms of transport. So these two things are, are, are working together, okay? So, so if you're going to change one, the tree is also going to change, okay? So if I'm going to make an intervention here, which are the, 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 which are the places that I'm going to be affecting in London? And something super interesting is Temple here. Temple is right in the middle of the city. If uh, you have been to the city, this is where King's College is, this is where uh, Somerset House is, right in the middle of the city. You know, it's, it's, it's right here. Here is Temple, look at it. Temple, right in the heart of the city, very well connected and everything. And look at it, it is just, doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, like whether there is a financial crash, there isn't or anything, it's still on its own. You know, you go up the tree, up the tree, and it's on its own. It's not connected to anything else. And so this is not because of transport, it's because of the type of industries that you find there. So you have a very specific type of industries that take place there with respect to, to uh, lawyers. And uh, so you have very niche thing that wasn't affected by this kind of uh, situation. So something, something to think with respect to resilience and, uh, and, and so forth. Okay, so I ran out of time. I apologize. Um, just super quickly, <laughs> keep in mind the idea of multiplex networks and how they're going to be, how uh, uh, the measures in your system are going to be changing if you take each of the networks separately or if you couple them. And they're really nice papers about these uh, other things. Um, uh, this is a paper in which we, we show uh, how if you want to take, and this is relevant for the other one, that's why I'm stopping just for a tiny second. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, uh, um, obtaining a new type of contract, energy contract, 
how I'm going to do this in my space, right? So I need to find the communities. I need to, to, to couple the grid, the electrical grid with the communities that all together is going to be like an infection kind of, 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 of process of be, be, be able to share this technology with the community that, uh, that I, I am part of. And when you don't have data on this community, then you need proxies in order to create those. And of course, all this is relevant, 30 seconds, for <laughs> the resilience of the system, which uh, uh, one needs to be careful, right? Because once you couple these multi-layer networks, you can, you can actually, instead of increasing the resilience of the system, you can decrease it. And of course, we have natural systems out there that have evolved towards more sustainable resilient systems uh, in nature far away from what we're doing, like our brain, in which you have uh, 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 these, these different modules in the brain, these multi-layers kind of things, interacting such that resilience is, uh, is ensured. And, 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 and it has been observed that this is by, by, by coupling the, uh, the hubs in the system. So this is a few very important paper for a decade, uh, uh, from a decade ago already, you know, like uh, uh, some of them investigating what is going on when you think about multi-layer networks and what can be created when you're coupling these uh, things. Okay, so to conclude, we don't have a single way really to represent uh, 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 an urban system. So, so, so this is something that one needs to think about the different scales in order to see how we, we couple them uh, uh, together. And of course, to think about the different dynamics, how one system might be changing much, much faster than the, um, the other one. And how one, because of course, we don't have a closed system as well. Right, so, so the external fields that are going to be affecting each of these systems is going to be different and how these are co-evolving, right? So the idea of this co-evolution is something very important to keep in mind. And to conclude, these are the lovely people with whom uh, uh, um, I, uh, I produce all these uh, works. So, so the, top, um, the top row is um, the people a part of the project on water in Mexico. So we have, uh, uh, you know, earth scientists, architects, GIS experts, and, 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 and these are ex-CASA uh, people, mainly physicists, uh, Clementine Cotino, who is uh, an amazing uh, uh, geographer. So this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asa. This was uh, very interesting. And Clementine joined us 